just wanted to say, you will realize by now, you are all on mute, but you are all most welcome to leave your comments and questions in the chat line, and that will try to answer most of them or all of them. There will be a few links shared about David's book, Armenian Institute, and our colleagues who are here from Nasser and Oxford University. And the event would be recorded. Uh, so if you don't like to be seen, please turn your camera so um that's it susan welcome let me spotlight you and enjoy the event thank you dato and hello everybody welcome um we're really very excited about this evening and by the turnout that we have tonight i see that many many people are equally interested in this in this subject and in david's work I'd like to start by thanking our co-hosts tonight, though, that we have the National Association of Armenian Studies and Research, Nasser, from Belmont, Massachusetts, and the Oxford Armenian Studies, from Oxford. And our special thanks to Mark Mamigonian and to Professor Theo von Lindt for their help for this evening, and also to our own, the Armenian Institute's Nick Matayo, who's our, our program manager, who has organized this evening. We also want to thank the National, Herit National Lottery Heritage Fund, who has continued to support us for this. So tonight we're welcoming David Zakarian, and he will be talking about his book, Women Too Were Blessed, the portrayal of women in early Christian texts. It's recently published by Brill, and there is a um, link in the in the chat line for you. And it's published in their series on Armenian texts and studies. And as Tato said, we welcome David as we begin this week, that's, this week, this month, that's dedicated to a celebration of International Women's Day. We're just calling it Women's Month for this year. So the book that David is presenting, Women Too Were Blessed, is really a groundbreaking book. And it's a very, very careful and fascinating exploration of women and gender roles in early Christian Armenia, with a focus on the fifth century. But I believe that David will also be talking about how, in what ways, um, the information in this book, the situations, the, the ac actions of the women are relevant today. There's going, there's going to be some discussion of its contemporary relevance. He examines the rep representation of women in fifth century Armenian literature and historiography, and how the ecclesiastical authorities envisioned the roles of women in the society. But he's also looking at what he can glean from all of these texts about the women themselves, both before and after Christianization. So it reveals also aspects of women's daily lives and their lived experience of the time. As I said, the pre-Christian Zoroastrian context is included because it has, of course, a great effect on what happened immediately and long afterwards. So comparisons are then made during the Christian period between Armenians and the influences of their neighbors, such as the Syrian and the Greek traditions and the literary works of all of these. David Zakarian is an associate faculty member of the Faculty of Oriental Studies at Oxford, at the University of Oxford, and an active member of the Oxford Armenian Studies Research Group. His PhD was focused on early Christian Armenia and women and women's roles there. So this is his, his dissertation, which he's made into a book. And a recent um, British Academy postdoc fellowship provided him with an opportunity to research the historical value of Armenian manuscript colophons. And he's allowed me to say that also, David is a <laughs> International Chess Federation FIDE master, and he writes about chess. So this little known facts about David. We'll have a question and answer period after David's presentation. Uh, you can write your questions in the in the chat line. You can start writing them anytime you wish, and we'll be reading them out to David um, when he's when he's done with his own presentation. So 
I think without further ado, I would turn over to you. Thank you so much for coming. We're really looking forward to this. Thank you very much, Susan. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. And I would also like to thank uh, the Armenian Institute, uh, the National Association for Armenian uh, Study and Research, Nasser, and of course, Oxford Armenian Studies for organizing this book launch. As you mentioned, uh, this book stems from my doctoral dissertation. Uh, and I chose this topic for two reasons. As a young scholar, you usually want to find uh, some untrodden paths that no other scholar has been, or uh, only few have ventured to go. And uh, the representation of women in the fifth century Armenian text was one of them. And I was really very happy to come up with this idea. And the second reason why I decided to, uh, to work on this topic was the extensive training in feminist theory and gender studies that I received during my uh, master's in English uh, literature and culture at the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki in Greece. So uh, under the supervision of Kalus Kulpengian, Professor of Armenian Studies, Theo Martin van Lindt, I started this work in 2011 and finished my dissertation in 2015. I put it aside for a while um, and uh, began working on it again in 2017, trying to turn it into a book and it was published uh, uh, in um, this year, uh, actually 21st uh, of January. Now, um, the main focus of the book is the fifth century. And I want to say a couple of words why I decided to choose uh, the fifth century in particular. The si significance of this uh, century in the intellectual and political and cultural history of the Armenians cannot be uh, overemphasized. So if we look at it from the political point of view, we have uh, the abolition of the Arsacid rule in Armenia in 428, which means that Armenia loses its statehood and becomes largely part of the Sasanian Empire as in Marspanate. And of course, we have uh, uh, the political developments uh, in 450 and 51 when the Sasanians try to reimpose Zoroastrianism on Armenians. And we have the uh, Battle of Avaraj uh, in 451 when a large number of Armenian uh, uh, nobility were, uh, perished. But this defeat, it was a devastating defeat. This defeat helped the Armenians to reassess their Christian identity. And this event became a cornerstone for the formation of Christian Armenian identity. And it has been uh, perpetuated until today. So this uh, much about the political importance of the fifth century. Of course, there, were, uh, there was another uprising against the Sasanians, but overall, uh, this was uh, a very tumultuous period in the Armenian history. From the cultural point of view, um, I should, said, I should say that uh, the fifth century is the outset of the formative period of the Armenian church. When the written texts sponsored by the Armenian ecclesiastical and lay elites attempted to uh, con conceptualize the socio-political and cultural developments that were stimulated by the adoption of Christianity at the beginning of the fourth century. The creation of the Armenian alphabet by uh, Saint Mashtot in approximately 405 prompted primarily, was prompted primarily by the need to make the language of the Bible more accessible to a wider public. Despite the fact that Agathangelos, uh, the, the, the text that I'm going to discuss today a bit more in detail, mentions that Armenians in thousands converted to Christianity, it seems to have been a very slow process and that in the fifth century there was an urge to create a native Armenian uh, 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 alphabet to be able to translate uh, the most important Christian text into Armenian and make it accessible to the Armenian people. And also the fifth century heralded a new era of cultural and intellectual transformation of uh, uh, the entire society. Thus, uh, it became imperative alongside the translations from Greek and Syriac to write original texts in Armenian. And um, the, uh, the, the focus of these texts was primarily to evaluate historical and contemporary events as well as to try and forge a new Christian identity of Armenian people. 
Now I want to uh, uh, focus a little bit on the translations um, because uh, these translations influenced greatly the formation of Christian Armenian thought. And one would accept, expect that uh, after accepting all these texts, after translating them and learning from these early Christian texts, learning from the um, uh, church fathers, both Greek and Syriac, the Armenians would largely adopt their views of uh, different theological uh, issues, as well as uh, everything else related to women. Now, um, it has been shown by um, many studies, uh, including uh, studies by Elizabeth Clark and uh, Susan Harvey, um, uh, that in patristic literature, the scene committed by Eve is often, often uh, overemphasized and presented as the main reason why women ought to be considered inferior to men and uh, they have to submit to their authority. And the most uh, common um, a biblical text that was quoted comes from the New Testament. It's the epistle of um, uh, Saint Paul to Timothy uh, from 1 at Timothy uh, chapter 2 and verse 11 and 14 and I will quote this. This has been used many many times in the patristic literature. So according to, uh, uh, to the text, uh, Saint Paul uh, instructs Timothy and says let a woman learn in silence with full submission. I permit no woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She is to keep silence. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. So as you can see here, we have two aspects. Um, uh, uh, one is that Adam was formed first. So we have some sort of hierarchical division. Adam came first, so he's more important. And the second one that it was um, uh, Eve that first transgressed, she was deceived. And this was largely used by both the um, uh, Greek and the Syriac church fathers to show a lower status of women, the secondariness of women. Of course, there were some others, uh, some other church fathers, um, but what I would call uh, a peripheral view on this, that um, thought that through Virgin Mary, women were also saved. And uh, this was uh, another view that was presented in these texts, in the text of the uh, uh, church fathers. So when in the fifth century, the Armenian ecclesiastical authorities began the translation of this text, they had to take a stance to a certain degree, how are they are going to look at and present the role of women in society. Are they going uh, to accept the view that women are secondary or they're going to put this aside and focus more on the Virgin Mary? So I'm going to speak about this uh, later, how I uh, discuss this in the book. For the Christianization of Armenia, we have two narratives. One represents the Syriac strand of Armenian Christianity, uh, which is largely based on the doctrine of Adai. And uh, it is, the, the text uh, has reached us anonymously, and uh, the title is uh, the, uh, the Discovery, uh, the Martyrdom and the discover Discovery of the Relics of Saint Thaddeus the Apostle and the Virgin Sandukht. Now, uh, this first text uh, tells us the story uh, from the first century. Most likely, uh, and uh, most scholars agree with this, it's a legendary story. However, the, it has a very interesting plot. We have Christianity coming through a male figure. We have a Saint Thaddeus, the apostle, who comes to Armenia to convert the Armenian people. And there he finds uh, uh, Sandukh, who was the daughter of the Armenian king Sanadruk. And after Sandukh is converted to Christianity, we see that in the narrative she occupies a central position. And she starts promoting Christianity, teaching Christianity, preaching, and converting. So I, I stress these words because, uh, as I mentioned, in the New Testament, there was this statement that women should be silent, and I do not allow them to teach and preach. But in this text, in this narrative, we have the focus on uh, her ability to change the society, to uh, bring uh, um, uh, Christian, Christian ideas and ideals to people, and 
by her sacrifice, she is of course eventually martyred. By her sacrifice, she also manages to convert a large number of people. So this is one of the uh, uh, stories of Armenia's Christianization. The second story, which is much more um, um, influential in the Armenian tradition, is um, uh, the uh, history of the Armenians by an enigmatic author, Agathangelos. I'm not going to uh, speak a lot about this, but again, the main trend that you could see there is that Christianity comes to Armenia through a male figure. But most importantly, we have a female um, uh, agent who is present there in the middle of the narrative without whom this Christianization is virtually impossible. So we have the Roman uh, nuns, uh, Hripsime, and her companions who come to Armenia. They are martyred there. They shed their blood on the Armenian soil as a result of which then Saint Gregory comes out of the dark pit and uh, converts the Armenians. Now, as um, uh, one of the editors of uh, the Armenian Text and Studies uh, that published my book, uh, Valentina Galsorari has worked a lot on this. And uh, I would like to uh, refer to what she wrote about this episode, um, with which I absolutely agree. When we read Agatha Angelos' text, we see that uh, the physical body of Hripsima and her companions are put in the foundation of the Armenian church because the first martyria, the first churches are built where they were martyred and where they were buried. So physically we have their presence uh, at, at, the, at the foundation of the church. But the same happens also from the symbolical point of view, because um, as uh, um, St. Gregory himself uh, tells us in the teaching, um, women shed their blood on the Armenian soil. And only because of that, the Armenian people can be saved. And these women, Hripsima and her companions become the intercessors between the Armenians and uh, God. So uh, we could clearly see here that uh, their uh, role in Christianization of Armenians is uh, essential. Without them, it wouldn't have been uh, happening, it wouldn't have been possible. Another element of St. Gregory's um, uh, um, teaching that I want to speak about is linked to the title of the book, Women Too Were Blessed. These are actually the words that are pronounced by the um, uh, head of the Armenian church, by um, the founder of the Armenian church, as uh, it is presented nowadays by St. Gregory himself. He says, and I quote Robert Thompson's translation of this passage, women also were blessed on account of the virgin birth which was from among them. And I want to read also the Armenian one because uh, I, I really like how it sounds. So we could see that the, the leader of the Armenian church, the founder of the Armenian church, takes a part, uh, in, 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 incorporates in his discourse the aspect of the Virgin Mary being a uh, Virgin Mary giving birth to Jesus Christ and thus expiating and saving women. So we could see that this becomes to a certain degree the official view of the Armenian church already in the fifth century. Rather than relying on uh, the patristic literature which highlighted the role that Eve played in, in the plague of the humanity, they take up this peripheral, uh, peripheral view that I mentioned before. Eve is indeed mentioned there, but uh, the focus is not on Eve, and this is also very important. In this case, there is some similarity between the Armenian and Syriac tradition, where Eve is mentioned uh, as a person who was deceived first. However, as um, we find it in um, the Syriac uh, um, uh, text of Afrahat, uh, the Persian sage, Adam had free will. So, uh, he, he could have uh, he could have uh, disobeyed or uh, he could have uh, decided otherwise and not followed Eve. So the Armenian Church Fathers also adopted that view, that discourse on women, that Adam is equally to blame for Eve and we shouldn't put all the blame on Eve. Um, thus, we could see that 
the Armenian, the, the, the narratives of Armenia's Christianization clearly show a women agency there. We have very powerful women. The narrative is built around them. Without Hripsiman, without Sanduk, the Christianization process is virtually impossible. It is only through them that the Armenians become Christian, and this is uh, this becomes part of the Armenian ideal, uh, Armenian church's ideology. So while working on this particular uh, text, I was reading all the passages which uh, were um, uh, in, in which women are mentioned. I asked myself this question, and why? If you have uh, the church fathers so much influencing the Armenians, especially John Chrysostom, who is famous, uh, perhaps I should say infamous for his misogyny, despite the fact that some scholars try to find the different bits and pieces in his writing where he speaks positively of women, overall his discourse is quite misogynistic. So, and he had a, a great influence on the um, uh, formation of Armenian Christian thought. So why didn't the Armenian authors adopt that view? And uh, the answer here comes from um, the pre-Christian Armenian religion. And this is what I researched next to try and understand. I tried to put all these texts into the context, trying to um, uh, understand the mentality of people when uh, Christianization happened. What did these people believe in? And why, after approximately 100 years after official Christianization, there were a, a, a lot of people still in Armenia who were not Christian? If we look at Zoroastrianism, by the way, one of the um, oldest surviving religions uh, and uh, regularly practiced religions, uh, even today we have millions of people around the world who are Zoroastrians. According to the Zoroastrian teaching, um, uh, we have a very interesting uh, um, approach to gender. In fact, gender doesn't play an important role in, uh, in this religion. The, um, it's, of course, an oversimplification, what I'm trying to say, but I'll just bring the examples. Of course, we have male figures. Um, we have the, 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 the pantheon of uh, deities of uh, Zoroastrianism. Uh, the powers of kindness and goodness are headed by Ahura Mazda, and we have uh, the, uh, the powers of evil that are headed by a masculine uh, Angra Manu. And then in their camps, they have different deities. Some of them are men, others are women. Thus, the concept of gender does not um, determine whether you are good or bad. It is all about your choices, whether you take the side of kindness and goodness or you take the side of uh, the evil. And also I should mention that uh, in the Armenian tradition, one of the Zoroastrian deities, uh, namely Anahit or Anahita, played a very important role. We have uh, um, uh, the cult of Anahita attested in many Greek and Armenian sources. So uh, she was one of the most important deities uh, in, in, uh, in Armenia. So thus, if we look at the Zoroastrian worldview, we uh, can understand that uh, gender itself is not as important as I said. So, and what is the concept there uh, that the Armenian uh, church decided to keep and uh, continue with Christianity? How did they decide to um, uh, replace the old beliefs with the new ones? And I believe the word here, the, the key word here is collaboration. In Zoroastrianism, we have this collaboration of everyone, irrespective of their gender. Uh, a collaboration to try and promote the uh, acts of kindness and acts of goodness as compared to uh, the, the evil that tries to destroy this. So this idea of men and women fighting together against evil was quite appealing also, in my view, uh, to the Armenian ecclesiastical authorities in the fifth century. And this is why when we look at the texts that uh, speak about Christianization, we clearly see that uh, this collaboration and cooperation of men and women is presented very neatly. I would like to show you uh, a one picture. I will just share my screen with you. Uh, share. So this is, I'll make it bigger for you. Uh, this is the image of the Armenian King Tartat, um, his uh, sister Khosrovidukht, 
and um, uh, his wife Ashren uh, from the 18th century um, uh, by uh, Narashov Natan. Now, why this is uh, very important? So on the one hand, we have Christian women like Ripsime, whom you could see uh, in my background, who is a nun who has dedicated uh, herself to the life of continents. But Agathangelos also mentions actual women, women from the uh, court, the Armenian court, as well as the wives and daughters of uh, um, a large number of uh, the noblemen there. And in his narrative, he speaks about this cooperation of men and women in the uh, promotion of Christian Armenian um, ideas and ideals. So, for example, Ashken and Khosrovi Ducht are mentioned, are described constantly being next to the king while he's making some important decisions about Christianization. He also mentions other women who are there who are trying to help with the burial of the Christian nuns. And this image of uh, women being there, being present at this very important political, historical and religious processes is definitely highlighted in this text of the fifth century authors. So let me remove uh, this. So just to summarize what I said up to this point, uh, the Armenian church fathers, and this is what I discuss by looking at different passages that we find in the fifth century text, the Armenian church fathers uh, uh, try to promote this idea that women are also important in Christianization. They play an important role. Another scholar who worked on women in this uh, period, the Zara Bogosian, has written an article where she shows a very important element of a women's role in society. Women were the ones who provided the initial education to their children. And in this way, the Armenian church authorities tried to empower women because only through women they could have the spread of uh, Christian uh, uh, teaching uh, amongst the population. And only if they tried to keep the, the role of women in society as it was before uh, in pre-Christian times, they would be able to thus um, uh, um, make the process of conversion um, a bit faster and easier to happen. The, the first part of the book and the second part are dedicated thus to the context and uh, the representation of women, how the uh, ecclesiastical authorities saw women. And in the third part of the book, and I will speak just very briefly about this, um, uh, I tried to find all the evidence that tells us something about the real life of women at the time. It is extremely difficult because we have texts written by men and uh, primarily they are written um, uh, from the uh, perspective of a, um, a, a man who wants to promote certain ideals in society. They try to depict the, the public space rather than the domestic space where we have more women uh, present. And uh, of course, in this case, um, uh, we don't have a lot of evidence about uh, women's life, but I managed to scrap from different uh, places, different mentions of women. And so um, uh, in the book, I discuss, for example, the spaces in which women could appear, because there are specific spaces that are limited to women depending on their position in the family. So uh, for example, the widows and the um, uh, women who are of a um, uh, certain age, that is usually older, the wives of uh, the noblemen and um, uh, their uh, elder married daughters, they could appear almost everywhere in the public space. Uh, the younger uh, women uh, would more or less uh, stay within the confines of their house until they get married and so on. So uh, there are very many interesting details about this. Uh, so you could, you could read in the text, uh, in the book. Uh, but one of the examples that I want to uh, bring is, of course, uh, the example of a uh, fantastic woman, a uh, powerful queen, a very um, uh, controversial figure, I would say, Queen Paranzem. Uh, Queen Paranzem's uh, story uh, was described by uh, Alessandro Orengo as a Shakespearean style um, uh, tragedy. And indeed it is uh, that sort of tragedy because uh, she, she was a remarkable woman. 
uh, when her husband uh, was killed, King Garshak, uh, her second husband, was taken as captive and killed uh, by the Sasanians. And then um, uh, his son, her son, uh, King Pop, was still a hostage uh, with the Greeks. Paranzem becomes the head of the state, but also head of the Armenian army. In the absence of the commander-in-chief, who was also imprisoned, so Paranzem leads the army of uh, uh, 12,000 uh, soldiers, elite soldiers, and organ she organizes this uh, fight against uh, the defense of Armenia and fight against the Sasanians. Uh, she fails eventually. However, um, it shows that she had the power and authority, and the army followed her. And I hope one day just to write, I know there are some biographies of Paranzem, but um, that's a remarkable person. And I think we should um, uh, speak about her more in, in, uh, in, uh, in writing. And uh, unfortunately, because of her death, uh, she was uh, raped and killed by the Sasanians, according to the epic histories. Buzandaran Patmutyum. This part of her story is kind of obliterated in the Middle Ages. The, in the Middle Ages, authors try to uh, not to talk about Paranzem, even forgetting about her name, because it was all about the fact how she died. So um, another thing that I discuss in, in the book is the marriage patterns of the Armenian uh, elite and uh, of common people. There is some circumstantial evidence, but we can draw some interesting conclusions. Things like um, that in the fourth and the fifth century, the Armenian elite still followed the uh, Zoroastrian and pre-Christian traditions to a certain degree. And this is one of the uh, cases uh, with Paranzem's marriages. Well, if we look at the uh, lower strata of society, we see that um, uh, marriage by elopement or kidnapping is very common. And um, uh, we have also, I, I discussed separately, the canons of uh, the Council of Shahapivan, 444, a very important council. Uh, they adopted 20 uh, canons, and out of these 20, the vast majority speak uh, about uh, uh, relationships within society. And I will just mention one remarkable aspect of this. When speaking about certain transgressions, the church uh, leaders adopted canons in which they provide equal punishment to both men and women. This is, uh, I would say, a bit uh, unprecedented because I, I tried to compare it with uh, uh, Greek uh, laws of the time. We could see that women are punished much more severely than uh, uh, men for the same transgression. The only difference there in the uh, canons of Shahapivan Council uh, refer to the position in society. So if you are a rich nobleman, uh, you are highly unlikely to be punished severely. You will just pay a lot of a fine to the church and you will be fine, expiated for your um, sins. And I uh, finish the book with uh, the discussion of the violence against women. So we have one uh, story of uh, Shushanik, um, the daughter of Vartan Mamikonyan, who was uh, brutally killed by her husband, uh, a Georgian prince, um, uh, Vazgen. And uh, the, the story was uh, created in uh, Armeno-Georgian bilingual environment. and. Uh, it tells us the story of a woman who suffered for her faith. So it's, uh, it has a lot of elements of hagiography, but uh, most likely it is a real story uh, if, if you start analyzing the, the details. And this is one of the instances of domestic violence that we find in, in, the, in the text from the fifth century. But uh, one of the most intriguing things that I found there was the uh, reference to a certain chivalric code. We speak about the fifth century and uh, it's uh, of course uh, anachronistic to mention this term, but there was a certain code of behavior where women uh, were not mistreated, uh, they, they uh, were not mistreated 
if they were of a higher uh, social status. And there is uh, this um, uh, use of the female body as a bargaining chip, trying to convince the Armenian princes to convert to Zoroastrianism. We find a lot of stories related to this, where uh, an Armenian, um, uh, a wife of an Armenian prince is captured, and uh, they uh, are kept in, in, in prison. And of course, they are um, uh, presented as staying chaste and uh, saintly, keeping their Christian uh, faith. But there is this reference to a chivalric code where the captors could not harm these women just because they were lower uh, in rank and status than these women. So I uh, elaborate on this a little bit more um, in this uh, final chapter of the book. And to conclude, um, uh, I would like to uh, draw some uh, conclusions and say why this kind of research into 5th century can be of interest today and of importance as well. In uh, 2019, I was invited uh, to Harvard to speak um, at an event, a fantastic event, about uh, Armenian history um, that was, uh, we, there were researchers who spoke about uh, their research into medieval and early Christian Armenia and try to draw a link between this research and today's realities and see how it can be used for uh, today's audiences. And this was the first time when I started really thinking about these connections. And um, uh, later on, I, I, uh, when I travel to Armenia, I will share my screen and show what I saw there um, in Echmiadz, in, in the Holy See of the Armenian Catholicos. Um, just a second. So, this is a relatively new um, uh, structure building. It's huge, it's uh, overarching, it's imposing. It is at the gate uh, called St. Gregory's Gate. And you could see that this is the, the, uh, the, the center of Armenian Christianity. And today's ecclesiastical authorities have presented uh, Armenia's Christianization uh, uh, and uh, their symbols completely missing Hripsime. So we have King Tartat on the, on the left, well, to my left, I don't know uh, how it looks like on Zoom. So we have King Tartat and we have Saint Gregory the Illuminator. However, we don't see Ripsime. And this is unfortunately the narrative that is presented constantly. Ripsime uh, and her role in Christianization is kind of um, um, either downplayed or completely ignored, depending on uh, what we're talking about. They are kind of idealized and presented as ideal women, and that's it. However, as I try to show in, in my book, this was not the case. They were essential to this. And here we come to the um, aspect of choice. We have the ecclesiastical authorities of today's Armenia who consciously made this choice to omit Hrypsime from this uh, image. And I think this is uh, the misinterpretation and misreading of Agathangelos' text, because Agathangelos and his circles wanted indeed to put Hrypsime at the center of it. If you remove Hrypsime from that story of Christianization, the story collapses. It doesn't stand there. I, I would add also not only Hrypsime, but also uh, King um, uh, Tartsat's sister, Hostovidurt, because it is uh, Hostovidurt who sees the vision, uh, divine vision, which says that only Gregory can now come and save the Armenians who went mad after killing Hrypsime. Thus, I hope, at least with this research, to try and slightly change the discourse in the Armenian church, and I hope um, uh, I, I, I could see that some of the representatives of the Armenian Church are in this room and are listening. I'm, uh, I will be happy to discuss this in the uh, question and answer time, uh, but I think this is very important that we actually present what we have, and we have very powerful women in the, uh, starting from the 5th century and onwards, and we need to celebrate them. And uh, on this note, I would like to stop and um, I'm open to uh, questions. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you very much, David. That was a, a wonderful entree. I mean, I, I, I've started reading the book and I urge everybody to, um, if you can, to, to, to read this book. It's, it's so accessibly written, very fascinating and very important, I think. Uh, David, I'm not quite sure where to start. I have so many questions myself when we have them piling up in the in the chat line. But uh, just to follow on with what you were just talking about, you say that there there was this transition uh, in the fifth century. But actually, um, early Christianity, of course, had many strong women, uh, many, many um, women central to the story. And, and Jesus certainly treated them in a, in a way that was very not just respectful but you know underlining their importance so transitions were made between then and later it's very interesting to hear you talk about the zoroastrian thought patterns carrying over uh into early armenian christianity as well i'm wondering if you could say a little bit about the transitions that later took place that would have been ones that took place across the Christian world, actually towards a more, uh, not more, but a very dominant male presence, particularly in the ruling of the church. Yeah, it is actually a, a very vast and important question, and it has been studied from different perspectives, especially the Greek and Syriac one. Um, I could give an example from the Syriac tradition. Um, uh, if we look at the work uh, of uh, Susan Harvey, so she, she, she highlights a very important change that happens in the uh, fourth and fifth century. So in the Syriac tradition, again, the female figures of pre-Christian uh, Syriac tradition and religion were very prominent and they were presented in the literary works. However, starting from the fifth century onward, most likely under the influence of Greek Christianity. Again, uh, uh, slowly women are uh, put aside, slowly they are forgotten, slowly their role is downplayed, and we have a more a patriarchal um, uh, 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 societies mentality presented in this work. So this is a kind of process that in the initial centuries, we have many women, they uh, appear uh, primarily in the apocryphal texts uh, where we have very strong female characters um, are trying to, um, to do certain things. And we also have even some stories we believe that were uh, written and uh, if not written, but created and transmitted by women. This is also a common thing, but slowly they move away from um, uh, the, the mainstream Christianity and they become more like apocryphal or hidden or uh, peripheral uh, stories. And when we have this uh, slow trans transition in the Greek and Syriac um, traditions, it comes to the fifth century exactly. So uh, the shift has already happened in the Greek and Syriac tradition. In the Armenian tradition, that is just created. This is the moment in the fifth century. It has no previous history. So they need to create something new. And interestingly, they adopt that a relatively more positive um, view of women's role in society. We should not forget it is still a, pat a, a patriarchal society. We have the ma male figures as the patriarchs, but this concept of cooperation is presented there and is part of, I would say, the customary law uh, because it's kind of the mentality of people. People uh, lived with uh, religion. Religion, unlike today, was part of their daily life. So it was uh, uh, very important in the fifth century to adopt something that would appeal to uh, a large number of people in society. And that's why um, uh, the shift that is happening in the West and in, uh, in uh, the Syriac tradition doesn't happen in Armenian tradition. Okay, um, but it happened later on. It happened later on, yes. But I'm saying how much later on? When did that begin? Um, this it is because it happened really strongly. It's not like it. Yeah, I, um, to be honest, uh, my impression is when I look at different uh, texts uh, from the medieval period, I could, um, I came up to one conclusion. Everything depended on the head of the church. 
depending on how open-minded the head of the church was, the decisions were made to allow women more freedom in the church. Thus, we have the, uh, the Institute of Deaconesses in the Armenian tradition, which appears all of a sudden in the 12th, 13th century. And it, uh, it still exists now in some parts um, uh, of the world. Like in Iran, we have women uh, deaconesses, the Armenian women uh, deaconesses. But again, it, it, it all comes down to the leader of the church at the moment. So the doctrine itself does not forbid this. Even uh, we have this very interesting uh, ninth century text, the Mashtots, the ritual book of the Armenian church, which mentions uh, a procedure how to ordain deaconesses. It mentions women deacons. So this is something that was enshrined in the uh, Christian text, but it depended on the church leader uh, whether to accept this view or to move on to a more conservative one. And unfortunately, the conservative one was um, prevailing throughout the, the century until today. Thank you. And uh, just to follow up on that, the, uh, your um, explanation or the, the, the two different ways of looking at Eve and whether Adam had agency, I think coming forward to uh, the New Testament, we have we're told that Jesus died for everybody's sins. Uh, you know, nobody at any point says he only died for men's sins. It's, it seems odd that Eve is left out and women behind her. Um, it is, if, if we look at the patristic literature, um, we could see that uh, starting uh, from the second century, I would say, uh, we have this text, uh, Tertullian, for example, in the um, uh, Latin tradition, calls the women the, the, uh, the, the gates of devil, some, some, something like that. Um, and uh, it, it is perpetuated by the author. So it's, it's like men writing uh, about this, interpreting the, 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 uh, the Bible and Old and New Testament and providing their interpretation. We don't have women doing, uh, well, we do have, but uh, we haven't, uh, um, they, they didn't become a mainstream uh, yes. narrative there. While in the Armenian tradition, what I presented with Agat Angels is the mainstream um, uh, approach uh, to the church. Thank you, David. I think it's fair if I give some room here for questions from our, our, our audience. Um, Judith Sarian, hi Judy, says, does Mithraism play any role in the position of women in Armenian society and the Armenian church? My understanding is that Mithraism is quite different from Zoroastrianism in terms of gender roles. Uh, Mihir in the Armenian tradition was uh, quite prominent and there is a um, an important study of Zoroastrianism in Armenia by James Russell where he in details discuss all these issues. Um, I wouldn't say uh, that, uh, well I, I didn't study Mithraism by itself uh, as a separate um, uh, as a separate um, religious of, um, um, doctrine but um, I don't think there is any influence in that sense because uh, Mihad appears in the Armenian text, but primarily you have Vedat uh, Ragna, that is Vahagan. Uh, we have um, uh, Ahura Mazda, or Mist, and uh, Anahit. So these three are mentioned, for example, in, um, in Agathangelos. Uh, and uh, of course, Mithra is, had some certain influence on, on uh, the Armenians. There were Armenians who followed that. But I don't think it had any influence on the ecclesiastical authorities because if you, if you don't find them mentioned in the text, so I guess they more or less relied on the three other deities that I mentioned. That is uh, Anahit, uh, Vahagan, and uh, uh, Aramast. And uh, uh, another evening would be really interesting to pursue the different varieties of, of belief systems that existed in parallel with each other, um, continuing, of course, into later centuries. Thank you. We have a, a question from Gregory uh, Shorikian. He says, thank you. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I missed, there's one before that from Armen Danielian. Is there any reference to Galatians 3, 20, 28? no male and female in Christ, or women like Phoebe 
and Junia from Pauline epistle, epistles in the fifth century Armenian texts? Uh, I wasn't able to directly find it, but I'm sure there, uh, there will be. Uh, the, mostly we have a references to some biblical figures. Uh, so for example, in his teaching, uh, St. Gregory mentions some uh, prominent female figures of the Old Testament, and uh, they are quite uh, representative because they are also very powerful uh, women who um, who changed the course of history so they are mentioned there and um uh, I, I i can't now remember any specific reference to this but that they do they use the intertextual reading of christian text they basically take and uh, use specific images which fit their narrative and they try to promote it at a specific view so i wouldn't be surprised to find that sort of thing i myself i i didn't uh, find it but um uh, it is again the same concept that they are joined together. I'm sure we will find it in, in some of the texts. Thank you. And now for Gregory Shorikian, he says, um, I wonder whether Christianity itself gives, a, oh, this is sort of like what I asked you earlier, it, enough ground for the women's high role. The first witness of resurrection is Mary Magdalene in Romans 16, Paul talks about Phoebe, and now these are all connected, who is a deacon. First Timothy 2 has many different interpretations, including the one that the Grappa provides. Also the early Christian document like the Apostolic Constitution talks about women very highly. So there's enough and ever more ground in Christianity itself, despite some individual shortcomings. Absolutely. Do you have any further? I absolutely agree with it. And that's why I'm saying that it is the role of, um, uh, of not only scholars, but also the church itself to promote these views because they are, uh, these texts are there. And we also need to a little bit think about uh, the 21st century. If we want to have more younger people in the church and um, uh, it, it is, uh, we are in the t 21st century. We, we can't just say that because of Eve, uh, you, you have to suffer. This is, uh, and this is something, as I said, was done by the church fathers in the early uh, period of the formation of Christian uh, thought. And it was done for their societies, it was done for their time, and I think we need to move forward and provide more interpretations. And it is being done by many feminist scholars, and there are quite a few books already written about this. So, and I, I try to do the same thing for the Armenian tradition because there is very little in that respect. But yes, Christianity does provide uh, that sort of uh, interpretation of women's role, and we need to embrace this. Thank you. Uh, we, we have another follow-up to the earlier question from Harag. He says, and I don't know if you want to add more to this, at what point did the Armenian church change in its attitude towards women? What was the historical context for that change? Um, it is very difficult to spot one specific uh, period in history. One of the things that I it's it's hypothetical, and I need to. I, I, I'm going to research this a bit more uh, in detail. I think it comes from uh, the court Atevatsi. So it is um, at the um, end of the 14th century, where we have the spread of uh, Catholicism in the region in Armenia, when Armenians are being um, uh, converted to Catholicism. This is the period when we have the emergence of the Fratres Unitores, the Catholic Armenian um, uh, Armenians uh, in uh, Nakhichevan in Kerna in 1330. So uh, during that period, the Armenian church um, is uh, trying to hold the ground. But the problem is with the missionaries, Dominicans and Franciscans coming to this region, it is very difficult. They are all well prepared in the, uh, theology and philosophy. And the Armenian uh, church is slowly losing the battle. And there we have uh, Grigor Tatevatsi as a prominent theologian who comes forward. And it is in his text that I uh, found this sort of uh, change, uh, this sort of switch uh, towards more uh, Western, uh, let's say, um, uh, uh, view of women's role in society. It is in his text that I see that, that, that he mentions that women cannot participate in baptism. Well, something like this we don't have. We have uh, Sandukht who actually 
it's not described as if she's uh, doing, uh, she's baptizing someone, but she's converting some people. So we can interpret it in different way. Maybe she's baptizing these people. How else is she going to convert them? Mm -hmm. So, uh, and in Tathavati's writing, we do find that women are not allowed even to approach uh, to um, the, the basin where uh, the, the baby is baptized. So this is uh, the, the first, uh, he's a very influential theologian. So if someone else before him has a similar approach, I haven't yet spotted, but I'm going to work. Uh, I'm going to work on this. But for the time being, for me, I believe it, it starts with Greek Orthodox theology, and it it happens just because Armenian Church is under a lot of pressure from the uh, conversions to Catholicism. Mm. Thank you, um, Gregory Shohikian has added to his earlier, uh, or to what you were saying earlier, by. Um, saying that we also had women Varta Beduhis in Yulfa until the 18th century. Roberta Irvine is brilliant in showing that. So there's further reading for everybody. Der Hofsepp says, thank you, David. Does your book contain any research on the female monastic tradition in Armenia? Are you aware of any female monasteries? So uh, in that respect, I do discuss monasticism, uh, uh, in our, female monasticism in Armenia, and I mostly rely on the work by Zara Pogosian. So she has written an article uh, about this, trying to explore uh, the uh, monasticism in Armenia in, in the fifth century and onwards. Um, in the book, I, I slightly take a different view. I try to um, uh, to see whether the church, the Armenian church fathers were looking at uh, female monasticism positively or negatively. Because uh, if we have a Zoroastrian uh, mentality of people, uh, childbirth is a very important part of it. A woman needs to give birth to children who will fight against the powers of evil. That's part of the Zoroastrian um, um, understanding of the world. And uh, a society that for more than uh, uh, 900 years was Zoroastrian, in, 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 in its um, religion, uh, this is not very easily uh, uh, deleted by, um, by the uh, mon monastic establishment. So, um, and the, the attitudes of the Armenian church fathers is uh, quite positive towards marriage and monasticism. They say it's a kind of choice. You can choose whether you want to be a, a nun or you want to be uh, someone's wife. But, uh, being pious is the most important, being a pious Christian is the most important thing. Now, uh, uh, according to Zara Pogosian, uh, after the Battle of Avarait, where uh, a lot of destructions happened in Armenia, we can say that um, uh, the female monastics, uh, monastic establishments were completely destroyed. And we don't hear of them at all until much, much later in the, in the Middle Ages. So um, although there are some descriptions, of uh, in 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 the Byzantine Patmutyunk in the epic histories and also in um, Agathangelos history, there are descriptions of female communities living together. And uh, in the book, I uh, draw the parallel between the Benat Giyama of uh, the Syriac tradition. So women who dedicated themselves to uh, continents, but they lived in, in the community and they played an active role in the community, uh, in the wider community, not only the monastic community. So we have the beginning of monastic establishments, but after 451, it seems that everything was destroyed and only uh, male monasticism um, uh, develops afterwards. So um, there is a discussion. I think it's chapter, it's one of the um, uh, chapters in the representation bit. Um, uh, the chapter is called, um, yeah, it is uh, in part one of the book, Sorry, in, uh, in, in part two of the book, um, where I speak about um, early Armenian church and female asceticism. Thank you. Uh, you know, each of these topics could be a whole, um, another lecture, frankly. I, th I think uh, a conference is called for here. De uh, David, we have several more questions. Um, one, next one is from Nuritza Matosian. Thank you, David. I remember your first lecture to us on this subject some years ago, and it's good to see your book published. 
on this important subject. To what do you attribute the downplaying of women in history if women held positions of power in the court and society? Um, as I said, uh, thank you, Nuritza. Actually, it was in 2013, I remember, in the Armenian Institute when I gave uh, that lecture. Um, as I said, uh, we, we still speak about the patriarchal society there. We have uh, the, the head of the family is a patriarch and there is a strict division of roles in the family, within the family. And the similar strict division um, has been preserved uh, in the wider society as well. So there could be many reasons for this, for this uh, downplaying. Uh, primarily, I would say the fact that the discourse was in the hands of men. So men wrote about women for many, many centuries. We have a female poet from the eighth century, if I'm not mistaken. She writes some religious poetry, but in, in the vast majority of texts, uh, well, I, I can't remember of any text that was composed by a woman. Uh, we have men writing about society, about um, uh, uh, the, um, the role of the church in society, about history. And this is the, the reason why we have, to a certain degree, the downplaying uh, of the role of women. However, it's not always the case. They don't always downplay. So there are some powerful women in, in a later period. For example, we have from the Cilician uh, period, we have powerful uh, queens and uh, wives of, uh, of princes who played an important role. And their role is not downplayed at all. I mean, it is presented as, as it is but still within uh, the um, uh, um, confines of a patriarchal society. So it's, it's just about uh, presenting them and talking about them, bringing them, uh, giving them voice. I think this is one uh, thing that is really missing, that we uh, don't try to give uh, these women voice. These women usually appear in scholarly studies as kind of secondary, uh, as uh, completing the story about the most important men figure, male figure there. However, we should uh, uh, switch a little bit the perspective and focus more on women themselves, because otherwise we can't write a complete history uh, if we uh, decide to downplay the role of half of the population. Uh, in, yeah. There's, there's also this transition that we keep coming back to, that in the New Testament, it's clear that men and women had partnership marriages. There's, there are many examples of this in the New Testament. Uh, and that women were leaders, that women were doing, had agency. Uh, what keeps coming up, what you keep mentioning is they didn't write books. So the more that men started writing about the experience of, of life or about religion, whatever, the more women got not only written out of them, but evidently demoted in real life as well. The evidence shows that women were illiterate because otherwise they couldn't uh, contribute to um, uh, teaching. They are actually teaching. And uh, for example, I mentioned uh, Saint uh, Shushanik. So she is the one uh, who teaches her children uh, Christianity when her husband decides to convert to Zoroastrianism. It is there that um, uh, the author mentions that she goes into her hut and she sits there and starts reading religious books. They were illiterate, they could write, but because the, the the, 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 the books, the manuscripts were primarily uh, created in monastic uh, establishments. And since we do not have female monastic establishments for many centuries to come, we of course have uh, only men writing about history, about uh, women themselves. Or somebody just didn't, their agents weren't good enough. <laughs> they didn't keep these things. Okay, we've got a problem. This is very interesting, but let me, let's go on. We have more questions here. Uh, Ani Honarchian, have you seen a disjunctive in Zoroastrianism cosmology and its law codes? And it's what so uh, law? Uh, law. Uh, codes. Yeah, I actually use the uh, the Sasanian law codes that we have uh, that have been preserved, and I uh, draw some, uh, especially when I um, uh, write about the family structure. We could see some striking similarities with what we find in this Zoroastrian uh, law codes. Yeah, uh, there, there is research saying that, in fact, especially in the Sasanian period, we have um, a very 
uh, misogynistic discourse coming in uh, in, in, in Zoroastrian um, uh, society, but um, in, in, in Sasanian society. But I, I, I looked at many sacred texts of Zoroastrianism, and we could clearly see there that there is no downplaying of, uh, of uh, women's role there. If women are on the side of goodness and kindness, they, they contribute to it and that's it so as I repeat gender doesn't play an important role but within the society we see a different uh, reflection of this indeed women uh, are treated as secondary because uh, they are kind of and I, I can I can tell you about uh, a small difference that we find in the Armenian tradition and in the Zoroastrian tradition and uh, as uh, if we compare it with the law codes so in uh, Zoroastrian law codes in um, um, the famous one uh, the uh, Madigan uh, Hazar Dadastan, um, um, that's approximately the title of this book. We see that women uh, have to be represented by men in, in public disputes, in everything. So the head of the family or her husband uh, uh, should represent her there and she has no right of, um, and she, she ties her, uh, she, she cuts her ties with her family when she gets married and she becomes part of her husband's family. Uh, this was uh, analyzed by uh, Anahit Berikhanyan as well when she writes about the law code and uh, she explains uh, about the structure of Zoroastrian society. In the Armenian tradition, for example, we don't have that cutting ties with the uh, wife's family. A woman marries into a family, but she keeps the ties with her, with her paternal family as well. And this is a, a big difference that we see in Zoroastrian um, uh, in in Sasanian law codes and uh, in Armenia. And as I said again, with the punishment, for example, uh, the, the, the fifth century, um, the Shahapivan canons uh, established same punishment to men and women, while in Zoroastrian, in, in Sasanian law code, it's not the case. Women are punished much more severely. So uh, this is why uh, sometimes um, some scholars believe, and uh, I also agree with them, that the Armenian Zoroastrianism was not pure Zoroastrians as we know from the Sasanian and Parthian sources or Achaemenid sources. The Armenian Zoroastrian is contain, uh, contained in itself also the beliefs of, um, well, the in the European uh, customary beliefs that the Armenians had. The Urartian uh, several uh, uh, deities were incorporated into the pantheon of Armenian Zoroastrians. For example, we find uh, in Vahagan, in Verathragna, that he has characteristic features of the Urartian uh, god Teisheba which is absent in the Sasanian Zoroastrian. So it was a different uh, version of Zoroastrians in Armenia. And um, in that sense, yeah, we can draw some parallels and we have to be very careful with this, but uh, we don't see any complete overlap. Thank you. A very, a very full answer there. Uh, Arthur Gaizakian says, thank you, David. This is incredible. What was St. Vartan Mamigonian's perspective of women in the fifth century? Do we know about that? We don't. We only have two uh, narratives, two stories by Yerishe and Razar Parpeti, who write afterwards, and uh, they have a different agenda. They want to create uh, figures that people can try to imitate. They try to create uh, some um, uh, ideology. Uh, for example, they draw, uh, Yerisha, for example, draws a close parallel between what Vartan Mamikonyan and the Armenian nobility does with the uh, uh, Book of the Maccabees, that they go consciously and sacrifice themselves for their faith. So there is a specific agenda and they write from that perspective. Um, and so we don't know what Vartan Mamikoyan himself thought. But one uh, thing that I uh, just remembered, perhaps I could add, um, it comes from the same story. When the Battle of Avarite happened and women, uh, Armenian women uh, who did not take part in this battle uh, stayed behind. So a vast number of uh, the noble uh, families lost their uh, head of the family, their junior members, uh, some were imprisoned and taken to Iran. And Yerishe and Razar Parpeti describe the sufferings of these women. And interestingly, um, uh, they are very, uh, very, very close in their description because they show what these women lost from their previous life and how they suffered, but what pious they were, and so on. 
and I managed to find a parallel text in John Chrysostom. Uh, where he speaks about the more or less similar thing that women renounced the earthly pleasures, renounced everything that they had. But there is a very subtle difference. John Chrysostom uses these women to shame men. He basically says, if women can do this, you men can do this too. You can renounce all the earthly pleasures. In the Armenian text, which follows very closely to John Chrysostom, and I'm uh, sure that it was influenced by John Chrysostom text, this shaming is absent. It is just an encomium to women, trying to show how brave and how uh, dedicated they were. And that's it. No shaming and nothing. So once again, we see that a Greek text has been uh, used in the army, like an intertextual use of this uh, text, but from a different perspective. The shaming is not there. And I think it is remarkable. It is done consciously and it is remarkable. Thank you. So even though you started out saying you don't know, we've got a good answer. But that, well, that's not Vartan. Well, well, it's yeah. not his perspective. Yeah. I get yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I hope everybody understood that. Yeah. And as you say in your book, these people are also building a narrative of how, how people should behave or how they want people to behave. Um, Ashley Bozian says, thank you, Dr. Zakarian. I would love to hear your thoughts on how to center these women's narratives to improve the position of women in the modern Armenian church, specifically in regards to combating problems of domestic violence in Armenia and the diaspora, and the church's responsibility in that arena. And I see that Olivia Katranjan says that she'd love to hear your thoughts on, on this question also. It is a very important question. And thank you very much for asking this. I believe the first thing to do is to talk about this openly. Something that a, a very conservative uh, society is reluctant to do, but we need to speak about this. We need to speak and present uh, these women. We need to write history that speaks, that gives a voice to these women. And it is very important to highlight their role in society and highlight not just the idealized way as usually the authors present, like uh, describing their beauty and chastity only, but highlighting their acts, their deeds, what they actually did, and try to present it from their perspective rather than from a, a perspective of um, the, uh, the, the, the male authors, which usually happens. I think the church also needs to speak a bit more openly about this. Yes, we as uh, the church celebrates um, uh, different um, uh, um, uh, aspects of Herbsimes' uh, life and um, or the Virgin Mary and so on, but I think. Uh, just the, the first thing that I mentioned with this monument, the gates of St. Gregory. I mean, even, even the books, if you take the, the, the school books that we have, uh, even uh, when, when, when you read, even in diaspora, we find these textbooks of the Armenian schools that still downplay the role of, uh, of Haripsime, for example, when they uh, speak about Christianization narrative. This should be uh, changing. This is one of the things. And also, um, uh, to be honest, one of the uh, reasons that I could uh, mention for me why it is important. I have heard this expression that it is our tradition. And this is said usually by uh, men who have no idea about that tradition. And this is what I want to present. This, the, the, uh, the, the stories of Agathangelos and uh, the anonymous uh, author of, for example, uh, the martyrdom of Saint Sandurt. This is the tradition if you want to refer to we need to change the concept of tradition. Yes, it was a patriarchal society, but it was, um, at least the, the narrative was uh, different. We need to celebrate these women. We need to present that the tradition was built on uh, respect and trust uh, between men and women, rather than trying to uh, kind of just uh, say that in the 19th century, this was the, uh, the, the, the tradition and we have to follow this. I think speaking about it, writing about this and educating uh, the younger generation by better books, this is one of the things that we could do.
And I, I know uh, Ashley herself works on uh, women in the Armenian tradition, and it is it is fantastic that we have more and more scholars working in this uh, direction. And I hope very soon we'll find many other books written uh, about their role in society. At least I'm planning one, another one. <laughs> That's good news. Thank you, David. Uh, we have two more questions, that, which I think you can probably answer together. So I'll give them. I'll give them both to you. One is from Theo van Lind. Uh, he says, have you come across female scribes who write about themselves in colophons? And mm -hmm. can I give you the, Richard, yeah, yeah. Richard yeah. An Anushian asks, says, fantastic talk, thank you. How about women contributing to manuscript illumination? Obviously in later centuries, as not much before the eighth century has survived, do you feel their role has been also been underplayed in historiography? Uh, these are very good questions, and I have been looking into this in the in the recent years, especially uh, when I was doing my um, uh, British Academy postdoctoral research. Um, the 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 period that I researched and translated the text. Um, uh, doesn't mention women scribes. So uh, I, I haven't come across myself, but I know some other people's research. Um, uh, for example, we know of female scribes in uh, Artsakh, in Nagorno-Karabakh Armenian monasteries where they were writing and copying manuscripts. Uh, I know of one, uh, I think it's in Walters Museum or in Getty Museum, I'm not quite sure, but there is another one, an illumination, which was done by a brother and a sister, so a, female, a woman's name is mentioned there as well. This is another fascinating story that we need to focus on and try to write, but uh, in, in later periods we do have women writing and copying manuscripts. Uh, there is no specific study on this yet, and I hope this will be another uh, important project um, for someone interested in, in uh, the manuscript illuminations and uh, uh, manuscript production traditions in general. And uh, but I should say that the colophons themselves contain a lot of information about women. And this is, uh, again, understudied topic. We need to, to look into it and try to find as, uh, we, there are stories. There are stories about their daily life. There are stories about how women would, um, I can give you one example, um, a woman who married into a family, but a tragedy happens within the family. And what she does, she sells all, all her da dowry. So she, a woman kept her dowry and had the assets when she married into someone's, uh, into, into a family. She still brought these things with her and she could uh, control them. So she sells everything that she had to sponsor a manuscript. And the scribe says, please pray for the salvation of the soul of this woman, because she gave all her money for the sake of the member of the family who was suffering. And if uh, in prayers you could remember her, that will um, uh, allow her to find um, uh, absolution to her sins and she will go to heaven. So there are a lot of women mentioned there and uh, it is another research topic. Um, I would encourage people, uh, researchers, uh, to, to look into this. Indeed, indeed, you've opened so many questions that people could, could and should follow up on. Uh, Theo has added that there is a 17th century woman copyist of Nardek who has quite an interesting colophon. And yeah, I stopped, I stopped in the, uh, at the end of the 15th century, so I, I didn't uh, venture a bit further to the 17th, but thank you, Theo. Great. Uh, Nick has written to, to remind us that um, there is a feedback form in the, in the chat line, and we would really appreciate it if you could uh, fill that out, tell us what you thought about this evening. It's important for our funders, um, but it's also important for us because we, we learn going forward, and I'm sure uh, David would like to hear from you. And Dato has found the manuscript, in the, it's in the Getty. Uh, that you mentioned earlier in the Getty Museum. Uh, Noritza has asked if you found discrimination against women in the law codes. Um, law codes are uh, come a bit later. 
Uh, so uh, we have Mahital Gosh low code, and then we have uh, some bad spot up at our constables low code, which is mostly a translation uh, from French. But um, I looked in. I, I looked into it. These these texts are very important uh, for our understanding of the role of women in society in medieval times. In, in early church canons, we don't have the discrimination, and uh, this is very important to mention. In, in later times, we do have some sort of, um, uh, it, it's still a patriarchal society. We should always remember this. There were three studies of uh, the medieval Armenian law codes, uh, which were done in the 1960s. And their, their conclusion was, um, in general, that if we compare it to what we have in the neighboring uh, cultures, they, of course, refer to the uh, Muslim culture because Armenia becomes part of the Muslim world, um, the great Armenia. Um, women are still treated with much more respect and they have much more, uh, many more rights. Uh, but I think, uh, yeah, I. I I don't have a very uh, thorough view on this, but I know that this kind of research has been done. And um, yeah, I think we, we see that women are treated slightly uh, differently than men in the Middle Ages as compared to what we have in Shahabi one canons. And one of our future big discussions should be about the many variations on what patriarchy means, because we, we use it as a word that it covers the whole, lots of variations, uh, even within one group of people. So uh, we have some great lectures, keep it up. Um, lots of compliments for you, David, you have to read the chat line here. Thank you. Uh, thank you to everybody for listening. Thank you for your comments. Um, Thank you. Uh, uh, Nick is also putting in the links to our co-hosts. Thanks again to the Oxford Armenian Studies and to Nasser in Belmont, Massachusetts. And, and I can see there are a lot of friends from the States that are visiting with us tonight. Thank you for coming middle of your afternoon there or morning, as Tato said. Um, and from Europe as well, Olivia, Brussels all over the place. This is fantastic. Really, David, it's been, it's been great. And clearly, there's a tremendous interest. And I think we need to have some, some follow up on this. It would be really great. Do you want to say anything before we bid each other good night? Um, perhaps I want to say a few words about the, the, the cover of the book and yes. the, that you could see there. Um, so this is a uh, photo done by my very good friend. Yes. I'm sorry, maybe people haven't seen the book. They don't know that that's the cover of your book. Oh, so. uh, let me share it. I think I, I have it. Uh, yeah, so. it'd be great if you could show that. Yeah. Um, so this was, this is, uh, I, I came across this image um, of Hripsime standing on uh, Tartat, on King Tartat. And uh, it, it's it's really beautiful and I think it symbolizes very well how Christianity came to Armenia. It was because of her defeat of um, uh, of the pagan king at the time that she was martyred. So the, there is this very beautiful description of um, trying to find, sorry, uh, there is a beautiful description of the fight between uh, Tartat and uh, and Hripsime in his chambers where Ripsime, uh, empowered by the Holy Spirit, defeats uh, Tartat and this picture symbolizes it. Okay, I, I guess I will share with you only the, um, I have this image on the PowerPoint. So, so here I, uh, I have the image. Uh, I hope you could see it. So you could see that uh, Ripsime is standing uh, on a Tartat, uh, who's holding, who's got the crown and is holding this, um, uh, the, I guess it's a knife in his hands. This is from the um, uh, 1917 uh, church in Crimea. So a very good friend of mine, uh, Tatevik Sarksyan, um, took this picture. Uh, she herself and her husband, Merujan, uh, have done a great job of writing down about the Armenian um, um, churches and Armenian cultural heritage in Crimea. 
And uh, so this is this comes from the church of Saint Ripsime, which was originally uh, Saint Sarkis church. And uh, I, I really think that this symbolizes very well the the approach that Agathangelos presents in his text, that Ripsime's Christianity defeats uh, Tartat's paganism. Yes, that's that's the last thing that I wanted to mention. Okay, thank you so much. And she's not only that, but a powerful man she defeated. So that's that's terrific. Bartat was a very famous for his physical power, and it is repeated several times by Agathangelos, but empowered by a divine uh, uh, spirit, she manages to defeat him in an eight-hour physical struggle. And it is described uh, with a vocabulary using uh, military vocabulary, basically. It's a kind of physical fight that happens, and Hripsime defeats him. I, I think that you mention in your book that she's, some people think that she's symbolizing the power of Christianity, whereas he is, is uh, symbolizing the powerlessness or the weakness of Zoroastrianism or the, the old ways. Um, I have a question here about how to, how, where can people find your book? It is on Amazon, I believe, but... Um, I'm not sure if it is already available there. I saw it recently, it said out of stock, but I think if you have a, a, an institutional um, account from different universities have access to the online version of the book. Otherwise, you could just go to the Briel's website and if you type uh, women who were blessed uh, and my name, it will uh, come up. Excellent, thank you. Okay, well, that, that's a good, this is a good place to stop, although I, we probably have many more questions. We definitely need a follow-up. Uh, thank you to everybody for attending tonight. Please don't forget the feedback form. Um, David, please glance over at the chat line to see all the thank yous to you and all the bravos and abris and so on. Thank you very much. And thank you to our, to our co-hosts, to Nasser and to Armenian Studies Program. And to everybody who came tonight, yep. Big thank you, David. Thank you, thank you very much for organizing this event.